Edge of Christian Radio. Exposing the works of darkness and declaring a life of righteousness. Your host, Pastor Bill and Valerie French. Welcome, folks, to the Luke 418 Radio Talk Show, the leading cutting edge of Christian radio. Today we have with us the Righteous Twins. They'll be speaking on, Is Christmas About Jesus the Christ? Folks, grab your cup of coffee, grab your sports water bottle, and sit down because you're going to be going for a ride. There's going to be truth and information that's going to teach you and educate you about the things of traditions of man versus the birth of Jesus Christ. Pastor Valerie French, would you go ahead and open up with a word of prayer? Sure. Praise God. I'm glad all you here are here today. Lord Jesus, I ask that you would come and be with us today, Father God. I ask you to come and give us enlightenment, Father God, about your word, Father. Teach us your word and the truth of the scriptures, Lord, that we would become more uh, um, mature in the word, Father God, and mature in our Christian faith so that we could understand these things versus what we've been taught by the traditions of men. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, praise God. Well, I have my sister here today, Barbara. Hello. I'm glad you're here. You know, we're really close to Christmas, aren't we? Just a few days away. A few days away, and it just seems like it came so quickly this year. It really did. So we were uh, getting ready for it. I thought it was a couple weeks away by now, and it's already coming up in a few days. So, you know, um, I was thinking about Christmas this year, and because I've been through so many years of Christmas, going way, way, way back, I've seen the what's happened to it in our society. I've seen uh, the overemphasis of some things that I think are not really that good. And uh, the Bible speaks about this time and tradition of men In Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, talks about teaching as doctrines and commandments of men. In vain they worship me, teaching doctrines and commandments of men. And also in Mark chapter 7, verse 8, It says, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washings of things and many other such like things do you do. So it's amazing to me that the scripture speaks about the vanity and about the doing of the uh, traditions of mankind. And Christmas has become sometimes more like a tradition than a real reason why we worship the season. And the season is to worship Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who came born of a virgin in Bethlehem in a stable to be the King of kings and Lord of lords and to die a cruel cross on Calvary for our sins that we might go and have eternal life with him in heaven and escape eternity in hell. Now that's really the sole purpose of why I'm here. I really don't want to see people going to hell forever and ever and ever and ever. And throughout history, that message, since Christ was born in that little town of Bethlehem, That message has been preached throughout the entire world. And people have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and then everything makes sense to them. But you know the traditions of men are strong. And early in the Christian church, the Catholic 
church because that's where the church started after it left Jerusalem. It began in Rome. And the popes and the Catholic Church began to think about ways for the Christians to grow their faith and to, because they were living in a pagan world. They were living in a world full of idol worship. They were living in a world full of revelry, riotous living, and all kinds of um, ceremonies where they had traditions and pagan rituals. They were all steeped in occult and witchcraft. Very worldly pagan rituals. Killing of animals, eating of flesh, all kinds of things that they did. And the popes wanted to propagate the message of Jesus Christ and somehow deter the pagans so that they follow the Christian tradition. So what they decided to do was to take a pagan holiday date and time and let's make it a Christian holiday at the same time so that maybe the pagans would lose sight of the pagan holiday and adhere to the Christian holiday. And they did that with Christmas. They chose December 25th as Christ's birthday. And the studies we've done clearly tell us that Jesus wasn't actually born on December 25th. But he was either born in the spring or around September. But they nonetheless made this holiday on December 25th and thought that it would preach the gospel and that the pagans would clearly come over and celebrate the Christian holiday. But actually the opposite happened. Even though the Christians through the thousands of years have tried, the pagans have become more strong and they ended up the Christians were jumping over and following the pagan holiday. And they were reveling and partying and things like that. So we have this, it's almost like a religious tug of war that's gone through the centuries about Christmas. Although a tremendous amount of Christmas in this country came over from Europe and celebrated the nativity, Jesus' birth, as we should, because it is Jesus' birthday on Christmas. And it's a wonderful time to reflect that birth in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. But over the years, even when I was growing up, I celebrated Christmas as a little child. I was so excited about that day coming because I knew that I would be getting presents. And I know my mother and father loved Christmas, and my mother used to decorate the house with the garlands and the Christmas tree and all the bulbs and all the presents. My mother, boy, Barb, you know what my mother did at Christmas. Yes, I do. We were very, very lucky little girls. Yes, we had a fantastic Christmas. Do you have any memories from Christmas? Oh, of course I do. It was just um, our mother was so excited about Christmas. She had a really a heart of gold, and she loved giving. And so Christmas was her favorite holiday, and she was also a tremendous cook. So we just had the best food in the whole world. And she also liked, uh, my father did well in real estate and retired from the Air Force with a successful career. So we we did not lack in, in, uh, you know, provision. So she would run out before Christmas and just spend and buy like crazy for us and come home. And her favorite part was to get the tree up and decorate it and to go wrap all those presents and put them under the tree. And I'm telling you, when we came down that morning for Christmas, we just about, our eyes just fell out of our heads because that tree was just packed with presents. And 
pretty much, even though we had an older system, sister who was 13 years older, uh, pretty much Christmas was just, you know, for us. So we were very blessed, and uh, our parents were good to us, and we we're, we're just have a wonderful memories. Yes, I do too. Yes, I have wonderful memories of coming down the staircase. We had a spiral staircase. We came down the spiral staircase, and I remember the toys under the tree and the beautiful Christmas tree and the presents and the food and and having friends over and things. It was a wonderful time together. And my dad would put on an an album. I don't think anybody knows what an album is anymore, but it was those round black things that they used to put a needle on and they'd go round and round and music would come out of them. Those are LP albums. And um, he used to play the albums in the old record player. They were called records. And uh, we could hear, uh, I remember we heard Frank Sinatra and Ben Crosby and all these names that nobody probably knows anymore (laughs) out there. Uh, Dean Martin, my goodness, we heard all these old Christmas albums and Bob Hope, different things where they were singing Christmas carols. And it was just a a wonderful time with the family. And yes, there can be a wonderful time and tradition of the Christmas with Santa Claus. That was a, when I was little, I believed in Santa Claus and and the reindeer and and him coming down the chimney and, and bringing the gifts and everything. And, you know, there were other things that happened at Christmas. We saw all the little movies about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and the, um, you know, the uh, the snowmen and all the things that happened during Christmas. And yet, as the days and the years went by, every Christmas in the last, oh, 60 years that I've been alive, I have seen it subtly and gradually become more and more less about Jesus and more and more about get gifts and getting things and materialism. And I hate to say that, really, but I have to tell you the truth. And I started looking at some of the roots of Christmas and the traditions that we have in our Christian lives, And I began to be a little concerned about the fact that these things that we do, like going and getting a Christmas tree and decorating it, these things were rooted in pagan roots. Just like like I had spoken about, about them trying to put Christian holidays in the pagan holidays. And I actually found a scripture in Jeremiah 10 that talks about, I believe, a Christmas tree. And at least we call it a Christmas tree. I know back then they didn't have Christmas yet, per se. But in Jeremiah 10, 1 through 4, it says, and I'll quote, I'll read from verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the ways of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, For the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. They deck it with silver and gold, and they fasten it with nails with hammers that move not. And that sounds so much like a Christmas tree to me. You see, in the Old Testament, people were fixated on idol worship they wanted to worship trees they wanted to worship pagan idols and and they had idols in their homes that they would bow down to idols of wood and hay and stone and things that they would bow down to and God was constantly telling the Israelites not to worship the pagan idols that the ungodly worshipped, but to only worship him. Nonetheless, the many people in the Old Testament didn't listen to the Lord, especially even the Israelites who worshipped the golden calf. They have lived so many years with people worshipping idols. It just became a tradition. 
in their lives. They just saw the idols in the marketplace for sale. They saw their friends and all the idols they had at their homes. And they just felt that that was just a normal way of life, to have these idols. And when God came and they knew of him, he was invisible. And they're thinking, shall we worship an invisible God that we can't have an altar to? And we can't have these big parties and pagan festivals. And and we can't walk through the streets on it with a golden calf on our shoulders and all the ambience and the you know the celebrations and everything that the heathen did and that's why they asked the lord to build them to have built a uh, ark and that's why i believe one of the reasons why god did build the ark so they would have something physically that they could go to and worship the temple. And that, you know, originally it was just a tent. And it had the Ark of the Covenant. It had the showbread. It had the the, uh, the eight, can- the eight menorah. lampstands, menorah. It had the uh, showbread. It had the place to sacrifice the animals. And God did it in a pure and holy way for the Old Testament saints. Because he said, if you're not going to worship me as an invisible God and you're afraid of me that way, then I'll let you have this temple and worship me that way. And so they did. So the Jewish people did for for many, many years, thousands of years, they worshiped him that way. But I think originally, really, I don't think God wanted them to do it that way. And I can't be certain about this because it doesn't exactly state in Scripture, but I'm just believing in my heart that God would have rather them worship him in truth in their hearts and not have all these physical things that they could end up worshiping as an idol. So here we are now at our time in this life, say 6,000 years later from the time of creation and, and, and through all those years of history of the Ark of the Covenant and everything we learn in the Bible. And I'm not putting all that down. I'm not putting the Ark down. I think it was a wonderful expression of the way God loved and cared for the Jewish people and wanted them to believe in him. But now in these 2,000 years since Christ's death, we have evolved traditions of men also in our Christmas and what we do at Christmas, celebrating the birth of Christ. And I believe because of all the materialism and all the media and all the hype and all the ideas about receiving gifts and things like that, our focus has been shifted from what Christmas is really all about to now a modern party, just like the pagans did. And we only view Christmas as a time to receive gifts, which is really a very selfish precedence. You know, I just want to get gifts at Christmas. And a fo- it's really a focus on giving. And that's what Jesus did. He gave his life for us. And I know at Christmas we do give to others. But I just wish that Christmas would be a little bit more about Christ and what he did for us rather than what we can get at Christmas and all the decorations and presents. That we should sit around with our families and have a beautiful Christmas dinner and thank God for what he's done for us and thank Jesus because he came on that little town of Bethlehem 2,000 years ago and he became a baby into this world to live a sinless life that he may die on a cool cross that we might be saved from our sins. And that's what we should focus on. So we focus on Christ's birthday as the root of Christmas. So, Barb, you you did a little study on some of the roots of Christmas. Yes, I did. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about that. Well, I learned some interesting things. Um, December 25th was actually 
a Roman sun worship day. You know, a lot of those uh, societies and civilizations back in the old times, ancient times, worship the sun. Um, I know Egypt was a big sun worshiper uh, civilization, too. But mm-hmm. the Romans did also. And so they worshiped the sun, and it was uh, December 25th that that was the day that the Rome decreed would be the uh, sun worship day. And also there was a lot of pagan um, ceremonies, and they were a little before December 25th. They started about December 20th up to uh, 23rd. There was a lot of uh, pagan Wiccan celebrations, and what they called that was um, they were worshiping the rebirthing of the sun, which was the winter solstice. And we know the winter solstice is on December 21st. So that's what they were worshiping, was the sun being rebirthed. And uh, they would call it things like the unconquerable sun. And boy, but they had the, uh, the uh, they also passed gifts to one another. There was gift and revelry and gambling and, and like it was, it was very pagan. Um, I guess the Yuletide had something to do with the pagan Wiccan celebrations on those days. And um, so that was what I learned about the sun. It had something to do with, uh, Saturn also, there was something called Saturnalia, and that was another um, feast or celebration or um, sect that worshipped the sun and, and made it an idol. So that was the pagan roots of the, and why they, I think it evolved to the December 25th date. Um, also, I learned a little bit about um, the Christmas tree. And I thought these were very interesting. That uh, it says here that it originated in Germany. It also got its roots farther back from the Babylonian era, and actually, it was a phallic symbol. If you know what that is, um, it it's from Nimrod and Horus, which are ancient, ancient gods and goddesses, and they worshipped the, um, the phallic symbol. Um, I don't know if everyone knows what that is. It's a penis. Yeah, so they worship that, that, and um, they use the Christmas tree as a symbol of that. And they also, in Germany, they used to go into the forest, and they used to um, take the oak trees, and they would actually pick an oak, decorate it in the forest, and uh, worship it, and put silver, like the Old Testament said, put silver and gold on it. But they would leave it in the forest and not cut it, and so they would they would worship the trees in the forest and decorate them. And so it's interesting that a monk from the 8th century um, wanted to, um, he was a good monk, and he didn't, he was against what they were doing. And so he came and he cut down the oak that they were worshiping. And he substituted an evergreen tree for it, and he used the evergreen tree as evolving into a Christmas tree as a symbol of eternal life and saying that it, it never dies. And it was a symbol more, uh, uh, more befitting uh, Christian belief and explained the Holy Trinity because they said it reminded them it looked like a triangle, which would be the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they're trying to, there were many people that tried to get away from the pagan celebrations and the idol worship, and tried to bring in more holy and godly celebrations. And um, also I learned, when I went a little farther, that the first ornaments on the trees were apples. And that represented the um, forbidden fruit that was eaten by Adam and Eve. And then it evolved into into, uh, little glass ornaments that we use now. And the Christmas lights, they first used candles, and they were representing the Christ, who was the light of the world. And the star on top of the tree, of course, was uh, a representation of the star of Bethlehem. So I learned that about the Christmas tree, and I thought that was very interesting. That is very interesting, yeah. Yeah. And I also learned some interesting things about uh, St. Nicholas, who was the Santa Claus. His name was St. Nicholas, and he evolved into Santa Claus. And he was called the Wonder Worker. He was born during the 3rd century in Asia Minor. 
in the southern coast of Turkey. Uh, he was the only son of wealthy Christian parents, and they raised him to be a devout Christian. He was very religious. He was a man of God. Nicholas used his inheritance after his parents died to help the sick and the suffering. He became a monk, a priest, at 19 years old. Uh, he became the Archbishop of Myra, and he was known for his love for the children. Many miracles were performed by him and around him. He was known for his generosity. Uh, the, but uh, I don't know exactly how long these um, you know, things went on for, in his life, which is a good thing, and it, it, it created some of the stuff that we uh, evolved into, you know, all our beliefs about Santa Claus and the reindeer and, and the whole story about Santa Claus. But um, I was pleased to hear that he was such a godly man, but then there was this evil Roman emperor, uh, and he was very ruthless at the time, and he started persecuting um, St. Nicholas. He imprisoned him, and he and when, when St. Nicholas was in prison, he didn't die. He kept preaching in prison, and um, he was actually released. And he attended the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D., and he died December 6th and became St. Nicholas Day. They used to uh, celebrate his birthday on December 6th. And note, the tradition of hanging stockings came from a time when St. Nicholas left a bag of gold at the window of a home of a poor man who needed a dowry for his three daughters so they wouldn't be sold into slavery. And so after that, after he did that kind act, children started hanging up stockings and shoes in their homes, eagerly waiting for gifts from St. Nicholas, hoping that he would give them bags of gold and, and gifts too. So that was an interesting story about St. Nicholas. That's real interesting, yes. Yes, the origins of Christmas. Wow. You know, who knew? <laughs> yeah. So, yes, I think people should be aware and research and understand these things. And I would say that that it's the fact that people worship and and start worshiping the tradition like you said and start getting into the the rituals and they get fixated on these things and it becomes an idol to them that's the part that god does not approve of and the, constantly god is say come come back to me come back to me worship me because we should put our eyes on jesus christ and what he did for us and understand the meaning as to why we were, we celebrate his birth. And when we understand that, Christmas starts looking far more like just a pagan materialistic ritual that has many roots of different kinds, like you were talking about. And I know that... Oh, go ahead. Well, I think that um, what I try to do, because we all get caught up in the materialism, we all get caught up in, oh, my gosh, i got so many days, and I have to buy these gifts for my loved ones and my friends, and uh, I have to get to the post office because um, I only have so much time to get my things in the mail, and it's all, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, rises in mailing costs, so now I've heard today i was talking to a friend of mine now instead the solution is because the mailing costs are so high to run into the stores and grab all the gift cards so i have a friend who was shopping today and said that it's really hard the gift uh, gift cards get uh, sold out so you know and i do that too you know it's easier to send a gift card and there's nothing wrong with that but um i think that what i have to do is catch myself and say what is Christmas all about? What are we really doing? We're caught. We're all caught up in what the things we need to do and how much we enjoy the beauty of Christmas. And I am very happy that now that we have a big change in government, I am so happy now that I don't feel pressure or intimidation is a better word by saying the word Merry Christmas. 
I can freely say to anyone on the streets, Merry Christmas. And they, they smile back and say Merry Christmas too. And, yeah. uh, and then I was driving in uh, a little town um, by where I lived the other day, and I was smiling and pleased to see the manger scene in the middle of the town. Um, and I was going, yes. Yes, these things need to come back. Just our freedom to say Merry Christmas. We have Christian roots in this country, and Satan was trying to destroy them all. He was trying to take it all away, and he was trying to uh, take it all, so pull it away from um, the memories of our, you know, children and awareness of our new, you know, the new generations growing up that they wouldn't even know what the um, the Christian background of Christmas is. And they wouldn't want want it. So he was trying to do everything he could to dissolve any reference to Jesus or his birth in in our um, you know celebration of of Christmas. He yeah. almost succeeded, mm-hmm. but yeah. he didn't. He didn't. He failed. Yeah. So let's put a big F on his chest again and and just send him to the pit and tell him you failed, um, Satan. And it's coming back. Uh, the worship of you know, on Christmas of uh, Merry Christmas and Jesus and the mangers and singing uh, Christian, you know, hymns and songs and Christmas. Um, We need to put more of our focus on Jesus. I like to wake up in the morning, Christmas morning, and say, Happy Birthday, Jesus. Yeah. And, um, you know, I I think that we need to do more of supporting our local churches when they put on um, celebrations about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Not so much about the Christmas tree, the materialism, and all these things we mentioned, but about Jesus and His birth and what He did for us. And, yes, uh, and if it, yeah, if we can bring all that back, yes. and we can we can enrich people and 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 move their focus away from the the money and the gift buying and the and the and the greed of Christmas, that we can return to um, the cre- the Christmas season as a time to uh, help one another and give to one another. I know I'll give a kudo for my husband. He's a huge giver. And if I didn't, you know, help him, he would probably give all of it away. But he he's a very big giver, and he gives to people in need, and he gives to uh, the ministries that we support. And he's just got a big heart in that way. And yes, he, he never does. looks for anything under the tree for him. He just wants to give to everybody else. So I'll give a big yahoo for him for that. Yes, yes. And even you know we can actually uh, during the time of our Christian or our Christmas, we can actually get a cake and put candles on it and say Happy Birthday Jesus on it. Yeah, you know think outside the box. You know we can we don't have to do all that other stuff. We can do our own. Uh huh. You know and focus it more and having more nativity scenes with Jesus and things like that at Christmas. And like you said, definitely. Help other people. Help the poor. Help the homeless. There's plenty of homeless people around that are hungry. Oh, I have a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Uh, One thing that we like to do, we haven't done it too often, but I really like it when we get to do it. We get sent some uh, magazines from some ministries that we've given to for a long time. And uh, they're very good ministries. They're big ministries, well-established. And uh, they send us catalogs every Christmas with um, animals that you can actually um, give to the ministry, and they will purchase a cow or a goat or chickens or um, a bicycle or something that these people in these third world, third world countries that aren't as fortunate as we would just be absolutely, it would change their life if they could get a, a cow or a bicycle or a sewing machine or something simple you could give to some of the children, a goat, that would change their lives. That would mean they would have milk. And and so they would be able to, you can, you can purchase uh, packages of seeds so they can grow crops. And so we've done that. And that just warms my heart. That's just a great way to give at Christmas time. Yes, it's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you could sit around talking about ways you can give things. You could... Uh, have your family, everyone in the member of the family, think of a way that they can help the neighborhood or help other people, like you said, and send them a little chicken or something, you know, <laughs> and, and that would be a wonderful way to bring the giving part back into Christmas. 
yes, I believe if we we could all get on the same page with this and we could all focus more on on others and i I'm speaking of myself also um we could uh wipe out the tragedy and the suffering and the hunger in this world. Yes, yeah. I think if every one person gave to another person, mm-hmm. I think if everyone did that, there would be no lack anymore. Mm-hmm. But of course, we're talking about things that should be and not really talking about what is. Right. Because, you know, the Lord, you know, but, you know, it takes one person to start it. And then it can take off and be, become accustomed to something that we do. At Christmas, so I'm not, I'm I'm all for it. Mm-hmm. I'm all for it. I think we all should do this sort of thing, and uh, it. I think Christians too much kind of sit on their hands uh, and just kind of watch, and they think someone else is going to be out there doing it. And a lot of people just need some encouragement and direction with an idea. And a little nudge to go out and do it. That's right. And they need to ask Jesus, show yes. me, Christ, what yes. you want me to do. I am available to you. Yes. Yes. I am a vessel fit for the master's use. Yes. Use me. And um, if we ask Jesus and we pray like that, he will. Yes, he does. We've heard many stories of people going out and helping people and it getting into the news. Unfortunately, these stories are put on the back burner because they want the more sensational stories about murder and national disasters and all kinds of things in political realm. And they want all that evil stuff in the forefront. But there are stories of people in every town doing wonderful, heroic things. Look at the stories of the firefighters during all the fires we just had. That should be in the headlines, in the papers. Yep. But it's way on the back few pages. So, yes, there is a time of Christmas when we should celebrate Jesus' birth and put it in the forefront of this holiday. And unfortunately, I, I see a lot of people And like you said, Barb, this is so true. The Luciferian agenda is to wipe Christ out of Christmas completely. The devil would like nothing more than to have a gigantic eraser and just erase Christ out of everything. And he almost succeeded, like you said, in 2016. It was almost illegal to say Merry Christmas. It was Happy Holidays. But, yes, the Lord intervened in a beautiful way. Yes, and in the schools, um, yes. they were really taking out the Christmas programs uh, yes. in a big way. And they would, uh, when he started uh, changing it, you couldn't say Christmas program in the schedules. It would be coming home winter festival. Oh, yeah, winter festival, yes. yes. And the children were very discouraged. They were very mm-hmm. shocked. And they I don't think they liked it. And But mm-hmm. yet, if they protested they got a lot of um you know resistance there would be a few that that wouldn't want to participate but they were shunned and and scorned so we've turned around something that was really going in a bad direction yes yeah it was it was serious Mm -hmm. and um you know not only christmas but all the other holidays have been tweaked especially easter you know, it shouldn't even be called Easter. We're celebrating Christ's resurrection, his death on the cross. Easter was a pagan holiday. Yes, I think it started from Ishtar and Nimrod again. Yes, again. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So it had all its roots in paganism. And fertility gods. Yeah, fertility god. Mm-hmm. Yes, so our holidays do not have a great roots in them. Although many Christians have now hopefully become more educated about it. And I would hope that anyone listening today would not be horrified and taken, oh my gosh, I can't celebrate Christmas now. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. We really want to tell the truth here. 
we want to show the real truth about why we're doing what we're doing. We want people to become more educated so that they would become as a deeper relationship between you and God, as a deeper relationship between you and Christ, so that we would understand his life and death and resurrection in a far greater depth, and that we would understand Lucifer and uncover the darkness and his dark ways and what his plan and agenda is for the future which has nothing to do with Christ's birth. The devil would like nothing better than to wipe out Christ and wipe God off the map and bring in a time that's so evil on the earth. You know, in Europe, they have a a ritual called campus. I don't know if you're familiar with this. No, I'm not. But during the Christmas time, they have, actually, it's really true, they have people dressed up as demons drawing a sleigh through the streets, the towns, Mm -hmm. to try to scare the little children so that they wouldn't be naughty at Christmas. And they come into the homes and the children are frightened of them. And they look like Baphomet. And they have horns on their heads and horrible, hideous faces. And it's it's just something someone probably thought of. I'm sure Satan was definitely behind it. And it just grew and grew into a tradition. And now they think it's really something to go out and see this with these demons pulling a sleigh. And... The kids are terrified. So, you know, we want as Christians to understand all these things that are taking place in the world to really relish the fact that we know the truth. The truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he was born in that little town of Bethlehem. You know, God would like nothing better than for all of us to have a beautiful time together of celebration of his birth with none of these evil things around us going on. He would like nothing better for us to be sitting together, having a dinner together, caring about each other, laughing and thinking about him and what Christ did for us and where we're going to go when we either are in the rapture Or pass on to eternal glory when we're in heaven. And not have the evil things on our minds. What a wonderful time that would be, huh? When we do that together. That's why they call it heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where our destination is. That's where our destination is. So as a Christian, I just... You know, because what happens is when we talk about these things and talk about the demonic roots and the paganism and all these demons, things, people get offended because they think you're wrecking it all for us. You're ruining Christmas for us. Now when I sit down and eat dinner, all I'm going to think of is that horrible demon walking through with a sleigh, and I'm going to think about this little this, this pagan tree in my living room. <laughs> and, and, you know, you can't think of it like that. Because we want people to live for Christ and be close to him. But if we're worshiping in idols and if we're serving ourselves and if we're going out and just thinking about what we're going to get, it puts the focus on our, ourselves and not on Christ. And it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with celebrating with your loved ones and family. It's just where do we put our priority? We have to put our priority on giving at this time of year and knowing about Jesus Christ as the little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger and what he has done for us. And that's where we want to put our priority at Christmas. And like Barb and I were talking about helping one another, 
helping our family and friends, that's where the priority should be, not on the decorations and the presents. So that's what we should focus on at this time of Christmas. Focus on Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection and his time of birth when he came to make it all happen for us. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, folks, it is so important. If you call yourself a born-again Christian, a born-again Christian is one who no longer is attached to this world. Your citizenship is in heaven. Christ says, out of the Jew and the Gentile, he made a new person. Okay? Out of those two. And so your citizenship is in heaven. We're to live by faith. There's things that we have to do in order to draw close to Christ. And you see, you're responsible for yourself. It's not what your spouse says. It's not what your husband or your wife or your children say. It's what God says. You're responsible to him. There will be a day you will have to stand before him and give account for everything you have done. Folks, we are to serve Christ. And the whole purpose of Christ's birth is to glorify the Father. You know, folks, <clears throat> God had to deal with me several years ago about celebrating Christmas and bringing a tree into our home and decorating it and bowing down to the tree as we picked up the presents and gave them to one another. Folks, it is a a pagan symbol of idolatry. And as a born-again Christian, we're not to have that in our home today. And the reason why many Christians' families have is because they're not educated. Or they refuse to listen, as Christ says, as God says in, in the Old Testament. He says that my people perish because they lack knowledge. It's not that they don't know the knowledge. They refuse to apply the knowledge to their life. And they will have to stand account for allowing paganism into their home. We're to be set aside. We're to be set aside. We're to come out from this world, come out from the traditions of men, and live a holy and righteous life. And it's got to start with you. It's got to start with you being an example in your home. And for you to shine the light. You know, folks, again, the whole purpose of Christ's birth is to glorify the Father. And I remember those Christmas days, we did, we weren't glorifying the Father. We were just so concerned about presents and, and the hustle and bustle. i got to get all these presents. Where am I going to get this money? You know, i got to run here, run there, try to shop and get the cheapest presents. <laughs> you know, it, it's not glorifying Father. The purpose of Christ's birth is to glorify the Father. He gave us the greatest gift, and his name is Jesus. Without the birth of Christ, we would not have a resurrection. We would not have a defeated Luciferian kingdom because Christ defeated him on the cross. You know, the reason why we take communion is to remember to remember what Christ did. He went to the cross for the remission of sins. He went to the whipping post so you can be healed. And this special day that many will celebrate all around the world, this day of Christ's birth, take time with your family and take the elements of communion. Celebrate as you normally do as, as a birthday party. Give Christ a celebration of celebrating what he did for you. His birth and his crucifixion, him going to the whipping post and his resurrection should all be celebrated that day. Thank you, Father. Give God the glory and thank him. I thank God for everything he has given to us. Because he knows what I need. And so I praise him every day. Folks, 
I want you to have a glorious celebration of Christ's birthday. Amen. I want to thank Minister Barbara Lee and Pastor Valerie French, the Righteous Twins, for being on the show today. And folks, I want you to learn. You really need to come to point with God. Who are you going to celebrate? I mean, who are you going to serve? Is it going to be man? Or is it going to be God? And the rapture is coming real soon. Very soon. And folks, Christ is coming back for the body of Christ. Are you really ready? I pray that you won't be caught when he comes celebrating a pagan tree. Well, God bless you. Tomorrow, we will have Sherry Wakeman be your host on the Luke 418 radio talk show. Thank you for being with us today. God bless you now. Bye. To talk with Luke 418 radio host, dial area code 602-753-1950. Press 1 to listen live to Luke 418 radio from your cell phone. Dial area code 602-753-1950. From coast to coast and worldwide on the internet via satellite. This is Luke 418 radio network. Luke 418 Radio has been commissioned in these last days to preach Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the only name written under heaven by which men might be saved. Our mission is to teach and train up the body of Christ in the Great Commission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to cast out evil spirits, pray over the sick that they may be healed. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. If this program is a blessing to you and you would like to take part in this end-time harvest of souls, Join us by donating online. Go to www.luke418radio.com. God bless you.